Let's continue. We might expect a violent backlash from Don Quixote in light of Sancho's irreverence regarding his beloved. Surprisingly, he responds with a short story that illustrates that there's no accounting for people's tastes. It's a fantastic anecdote. There was once a beautiful widow who fell in love with a young lay monk. One day the monk's superior reprimands the widow, saying that he did not understand why she had chosen a man so base and so stupid as what's his name. The widow responds with great wit. Your grace, sir, is much deceived and thinks in a very old-fashioned way if you think I have chosen poorly by what's his name, no matter how stupid he may seem to you. Because considering what I want him for, he knows as much philosophy as Aristotle and even more. We haven't seen Aristotle for many pages, so this story is likely more important than it seems. Indeed, Don Quixote himself interprets his comical anecdote as saying something deeper to the Spanish reader of 1605. First, he states that he fully realizes that all love myths are pure poetic invention. But there's more. Moments later, he roundly dismisses the importance of Dulcinea's ethnic purity. My good Aldonza Lorenzo is beautiful and virtuous, and as for her lineage, it matters little, for nobody is going to investigate it in order to give her an official robe. And as far as I'm concerned, she is the most exalted princess in the world. He continues, I paint her in my imagination just as I want her to be, in beauty as well as distinction. And Helen cannot compete with her, nor can Lucretia match her. Sancho's reaction fully concedes that Don Quixote's transcendental vision makes sense, adding yet another curious and reflexive asinine comment. I say that your worship is entirely right, and that I'm an ass. But I don't know why my mouth pronounces ass, for one should not mention rope in the house of a man who has been hanged. Finally, Don Quixote takes out Cardenio's memory book and writes the letter. Before he does this, he has the ridiculous idea that Sancho should memorize it, just in case you lose it along the way. The squire's hilarious reaction is that Don Quixote should write it out two or three times there in the book because he has a very bad memory. So bad that oftentimes I forget my own name. These are weird comments. How could someone forget how to pronounce his own name? That would be asinine. Moving on. The contents of the letter have to remind us of mad lovers like Grisostomo and Cardenio, especially since it ends by insinuating that the Hidalgo is going to kill himself. That by ending my life, I shall satisfy your cruelty and my desire. Either way, more important to Sancho are the donkeys. Right then, on the other page, put your worship's order for the three donkeys and sign it very clearly so that they will recognize it upon seeing it. Don Quixote doesn't want to sign the bill. He insists that his florid mark, rubrica, is enough. Sancho says he trusts his master and the asinine legal agreement is finalized. In a comical and meaningful way, after all the haggling over the bill of asses, Cervantes returns us to the question of Don Quixote's penitent acts of intentional madness. Don Quixote has already said that the laws of chivalry do not allow him to lie, but here, Sancho insists that he doesn't actually need to witness his master's nonsensical behavior. But Don Quixote still wants Sancho to see him naked and performing one or two dozen follies so that he can get a general idea regarding the others. At this, Sancho is fed up and yells at Don Quixote, For the love of God, sir, let me not see your grace naked, for that will cause me much anguish and I will be forced to cry because I am in such a state from all my crying last night over the gray that I can't stand the thought of more tears. This is one crazy negotiation. In the end, Sancho prepares to depart, warning his master not to behave badly when he runs out of food. Are you going to take to the road like Cardenio and rob it by force from the shepherds? Think about this. Is a man who has just signed a contract with his neighbor for the payment of three donkeys capable of stealing food from innocent shepherds? If we recall the Golden Age speech, perhaps Don Quixote believes that everything must be shared. Moreover, whatever happened to Cardenio's escudos? 
A serious ethical lesson lurks here among the ethnic and religious problems of the Sierra Morena. But it's difficult to disentangle, right? Maybe that's why the episode ends with a confused reference to the myth of the Minotaur. Don Quixote suggests that Sancho drop branches behind him, which will serve as markers and signs so that you can find me when you return in imitation of the thread in the labyrinth of Perseus. Whose labyrinth? Don Quixote seems to have forgotten the real name of the creator of the labyrinth of Crete. Believe it or not, some editors actually believe that this is an oversight by Cervantes, and they even mistakenly substitute Theseus instead of Daedalus for Perseus. The final image of the chapter kills me. Don Quixote wants Sancho to see some crazy things before leaving. Wait, Sancho, and I'll do them before you can say an Apostle's Creed. And removing his pants with all haste, he was left bare below his shirt tails. And then, without further ado, he clicked his heels twice in the air and did two cartwheels with his head down and his feet up, revealing certain things such that so as not to see them again, Sancho pulled Rocinante's reins and turned him about, considering himself satisfied and content that he could swear that his master had indeed gone insane. Let's review. We have another dense chapter under our belts. Don Quixote's penance is the main issue. But penance for what exactly? What sin or offense? Does he do penance for something he tried to do to Maritornes? For something he did to Cardenio? Perhaps he does symbolic penance for others, for what Crisostomo's friends said to Marcela, or for what Rocinante did to the Galician mares. Or is this rather a kind of religious penance, as if our Hidalgo were a prisoner of the Inquisition or a medieval king of Spain guilty of some unspeakable crime? At the same time, we have the labyrinthical problem of Sancho's donkey. And all of this, while Don Quixote strips Rocinante naked only to saddle him again so that Sancho can depart from hell, or purgatory, with a love letter addressed to Dulcinea, which for its part, is also a bill of exchange for a trio of asses. More, in this chapter, we learn about Dulcinea's true identity and what she means to Don Quixote. Then there's the recurring theme of memory and certain confusions regarding the identities of our heroes. Sancho admits he's an ass, and Don Quixote is either the devil himself or else a version of Cardenio, potentially stealing again from the area's shepherds. Finally, Nudity is everywhere, and Sancho is even forced to gaze on certain parts of our mad Hidalgo that surely nobody would enjoy. We can almost see him turning his eyes skyward and shaking his head at the insanity of his master. The 25th chapter is another maze of threads that are impossible to decipher, but it's always fun to try. Give it a shot.